parents. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, good to be back with y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I usually like to start with uh, a couple of questions, if it's okay. Um, if, uh, we'll just raise your hand. I'm going to ask two, uh, one, maybe two questions, depending on time. Um, and thank you, thank you. Um, I didn't put them up there, so I'll just ask them a couple. I'll repeat it a couple of times, say it maybe two or three different ways. Uh, just so you can hear it. And again, please just raise your hand uh, and engage. These are not, like this is a question I'm going to ask you. You guys respond. I'm not going to respond to you guys. You guys will respond to each other, okay? So that the question that I really want us to think about for the topic tonight, which is standing up for the truth, and we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, verse 21, which is the theme verse uh, over these next couple of weeks. And there, there are some, some specific, I think, topics or, or um, issues that I think uh, you can think about whether it is topics that, social topics, uh, you know, the, the five Ds, if you will. Uh, what are they? Dating, dancing, drinking, that, that whole thing, drugs, all that kind of things, right? Th those, the five Ds, whatever social topics you want to think about, whether it's the five Ds, if it's the uh, uh, other topics, whether it's abortion, whether it's um, sexuality, whatever those topics may be, Okay. I want you to think about some of the factors that affect your ability, some of the factors that affect your ability to stand against cultural and societal forces. Okay? Let me say that one more time, all right? I'm just going to take four or five hands, and then we'll jump into the word because I think we need to finish um, by 9 o'clock. All right? So the question is, what are some of the factors that affect your ability that hold you back, if you will, or that fight against you from standing up against societal and cultural forces in standing up for the truth or standing up for what's right. Okay, is the question clear? Okay, let me get raise of hands. All right, over here. I think like not being educated enough on the topic and like being afraid of Excellent. Okay, so if y'all didn't hear her, she said not being educated enough and being worried about maybe saying the wrong thing about a specific point on the topic. Very good, thank you. Yes? Maybe being made fun of or ridiculed because like your ideas are like traditional. Okay, good. So perhaps being made fun of because your ideas are traditional, old fashioned perhaps, okay? Good, yes. Over here and then up here? An incorrect view of what the truth is. Explain a little bit more. Um, like if you don't, if you don't have an accurate understanding of what the truth is, then you can't stand up for it or stand up for the wrong version of it. Okay, excellent. So maybe having ourselves an incorrect view, either not enough information or having a wrong understanding altogether of what the truth is. Good. Yes? Well, uh, I would say it makes a free will of human, uh, human nature. Okay, so our own maybe desires, if you will, free will, our own corrupted nature, uh, not being, not, not sure that we can stand up against forces. Good. In the back. We'll just take two or three more. Excellent. Being really attached to society and not sure how people will look at us differently and how that'll affect, how that'll affect us. This is Man, you guys are amazing. Yes, y'all y'all are doing something right here. I'm not, I'm sure this is how they always are in Sunday school too. Yes, yes. Um, so going off of this a little bit, maybe you're too attached to the society, but you know what the right belief is. You don't want to stand up for something that you don't necessarily agree with. Like you might disagree with the belief, but you don't want to stand up for something that people might stare at you and say you're a hypocrite because you're not doing what you say. Good. So, so the issue is probably not you don't know the right thing. But you're not sure because there's some forces pulling you back. You stand up. Even though you know what's right, we don't always do what's right. And then if we stand up, then people call us hypocrites. And that affects our ego and our sense of who we are and kind of makes us feel bad. Right? Okay, good. Hold on. You've already gone. Let me go to someone who has a Yes. Uh, just avoid conflict. Good. Avoid conflict. 
Right? Some of us are conflict averse. We don't want to have tension with other people. Uh, some of us love conflict, okay? But most of us, we don't like dealing with conflict unless it's absolutely necessary, right? Good. Is there a hand back here in the back, somewhere back here? Okay. All right, this is good. Now I, I feel like I uh, have to go to the second question. I was going to skip it, but you all gave such good answers. So the second question is, how would you advise someone who is facing a difficult decision to stand up to the truth? What would you tell them? What advice would you give them? It's always easier to give other people advice, right? Okay. So what would you tell someone who's facing a difficult situation and needs to stand up for the truth? Yes. Admit his weakness when he's praying. Okay. So admit the person, admit his or her weakness in prayer before God that they're struggling to stand up for the truth. Beautiful. Well said. Let's take a few more. Y'all all know the problems, but you don't know solutions. Come on. Come on. You guys know solutions here. Yes. I just reassure them that it's always the right decision and that no matter what happens after you did the right thing, and God won't let you leave you to like, suffer too much more. Maybe a little bit. Okay. So rest assured that the decision is the right decision, even if it means you're going to face some difficulties and some suffering along the way. Good. Uh, okay. Yes. No, no, of course. Okay. You're, uh, yeah. It's, it's not a matter of uh, personal opinion, but let us see what the Bible says or what God says to know what's done right. Don't make it personally and think, well, this is what I think is right. Or so what we think or feel doesn't really make a difference. Let's stay stand on the truth. Stay on the truth. Right? Stay on the truth. Yeah. Go to the source of truth. Whether it's the scripture or the teaching of the church as it understands the scripture. Excellent. Let's take two more. Yes. Um, kind of going off of what Monica said, um, I guess I try to always remind um, by saying, or like, what is the main, like, what's the final goal, or like, what's our final um yeah, cool. Like is it really like to get that job or to get whatever that you might be like debating lying about or stealing or whatever? Is it is that the main goal or do you want to make it to heaven? Do you want to make it to be closer to God? Excellent. So keep things in perspective basically. Excellent. Keep things in perspective. So weigh the options, the choices, and have perspective about what each decision ultimately leads to. Good. One more. One more. Yes, in the back. This is gold. Encourage the person to sit with themselves in prayer and to listen to the still small voice as 1 Kings 19, 11 actually talks about. So we're going to be talking about 1 Kings chapter 18 where Elijah tonight, he's going to be Facing Jezebel and Ahab and these societal forces and same kinds of forces that we have to face, right? On some of the things that we know the answer to. But ultimately, the next chapter, chapter 19, verse 11, God instructs him to listen to this still small voice inside of him. And not to, if you will, St. Paul says in Ephesians, not to quench the spirit, right? To, to, to listen to that, the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Excellent. This is, this is good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So let me just start off by saying what, what someone over here, up here said it uh, a few minutes ago. They said, just because we know the right thing, I think you said it, knowing the right thing and doing the right thing are two very different things. Knowing the truth, knowing what's right, and actually acting on what we know to be right and true are two very different things, okay? Let me just give you a very personal example. Back in 2003... Um, I had a decision to make that I knew the answer. I knew what the outcome would be. Um, I had already thought about it. I had prayed about it. And just so you'll have an idea, it was the decision that I would ask my wife to marry. All right? I knew what I was going to do. I had prayed about it. I thought about it. And like, uh, not to sound not humble or anything, but I knew she was going to say yes. Okay? Not for anything. My, she's sitting in the back. All right? But I knew she was going to say yes. I was almost like 99.99999% sure she was going to say yes. But that being said, knowing the right thing, knowing the answer, knowing the truth, 
doesn't mean that acting upon it was it was probably one of the most difficult things I've had to do is to get on my knee and say to her, will you marry me? I mean, they're, they're very simple words. You can't get overly creative with it, right? I know the truth. I knew the answer. Like, we've been together. Things were going well. And, like, we had, like, talked about our life together. But knowing and doing are radically different. What I want to offer to you tonight is that I think many of us, and I was asked to speak specifically about topics like dating, dancing, drinking, fashion, music. And what I want to offer to you on the front end is this. You guys know the answers. I'm sure of them. Whether or not you are convicted in your heart of acting on what you know to be true or not, whether or not we look for loopholes to excuse ourselves and convince ourselves that we should or shouldn't or, or can do or just a little bit or just whatever it may be, I'm convinced that we are some of the most, we are some of the people that have more access to sermons, to books, to, to scripture. Like most of you have at least a dozen Bibles in two or three different languages in your home, probably 15 different languages on your phone. Some, most of them you don't read and understand, but it's okay. But you still have access to them. I'm convinced that we have access. The issue is not we know the truth or don't know the truth. The issue, I think, is acting upon what we know to be true. As we start the fast of St. Mary, we are faced with this woman, this lady, who had a difficult decision to make after the Annunciation, right? I mean, listen, hindsight's 2020. If you and I read the, the story, Angel shows up and says, hey, by the way, you're going to have a child. Like, you and I both, we know what comes next. Not because we've read the story. I mean, it's kind of like one of those spoiler alerts, like you just, you know what's coming next. Like, there's no way, nice story like that, she's going to say, excuse me, Mr. Angel, that's not going to work for me. She's not going to say that, right? You know what's the right thing, but doing the right thing doesn't mean that it's easy. Like, we knew, we know if it was any of us, as difficult as it is, Angel comes and says, this is what God is going to do in your life. It's going to be great. It's going to touch a lot of people's lives. And it's going to make your life very difficult. We all know that the right thing to do is say, yeah, sure, of course. Handmade. But doing it, very different thing. Okay? We're faced with difficult decisions that I think we know the answer to every single day. What I think is critical for us is that we have a will and a conviction that we are willing to stand up, oh, go back, go back, go back. I had to put a calendar since we're in Texas, all right? Stand up for what's right, even if you're standing alone. Be willing to stand up for what is right, even if we stand alone. One of the biggest challenges that I think that we face, whether you are coming from Egypt or born and raised here in the States, people in Egypt experience it, people here in America experience it, people in every part of the world experience it, is this notion of being trapped between two worlds. In Egypt, there's this notion of being trapped between, in Egypt, as everyone there, it's, for the most part, 99.99999% Egyptian, ethnically, culturally, but they're trapped between two worlds of Islam and Christianity, and what the society over there tells us should be identity for those who come from Egypt. For those of us who have been raised here in the States, the question that I grew up thinking about facing on a daily basis, am I American or am I an Egyptian? Or am I a Christian? I, that, that, that third factor didn't even come to mind until much later in life. Why do we do things? Do we do things because of our ethnic identity or our spiritual identity? And which factor, which force pulls harder? Which one are we more committed to? Last time, I was in Egypt. Can, uh, man. <laughs> Let me just give this to you, and I'll just say next slide, all right? All right, thank you. Last time I was in Egypt, I felt kind of like this. I was a Coptic priest in, a very American Coptic priest visiting Egypt, and there were certain things that I didn't understand. I didn't understand culturally, just being them. I just, I didn't. It was my 
real first time as a priest, or second time as a priest that I'd been there. And first time, actually. And I had just been a priest for a couple years, and I had people walking up to me, and, and they kept everyone kept asking me for a blessing. Like Every person on the street, I felt like I was bombarded by people, and I was like, this is wonderful. Like, I'm just, you know, praying for people, blessing them, and I walked into one place, and some guy was with me, and this guy sticks out my hand. I'm in a rush, and he sticks out his hand, and he's like, I was Baraka Abuna. I want a blessing Abuna. And I was in a rush. I slapped the dim five and walked in. And then the guy next to me goes, what do you do? And I, I was like, sorry, I'm in a rush. He goes, I'm sorry. I give. He goes, no, no. He goes, I think that guy was waiting for Baraka. Like he was, huh? He was wanting or bun or something else, all right? He was looking for something material, something physical, something maybe monetary, okay? I didn't know. It's not my world. Being over there, I felt like trapped. I didn't know what to do. And I want to say that that's a little microcosm of what most of us experience on a much more, most of you experience maybe, on a much more real basis, on a daily basis. Next slide, please. First Kings chapter 18, verse 21, the question that Elijah poses is a question of being trapped between two worlds. Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Just a little bit of back to this, um, background to this, this part of the passage. Elijah's coming up. There's this guy named Obadiah who comes up on him. Obadiah's a good guy. He's hid a hundred prophets, fed them bread. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And he comes up, and his name, Obadiah, actually means worshiper or servant of the Lord. And he walks up and says, like, I, are you really Elijah? He says, um, yes, it's me. And he goes, go tell Ahab I'm here. And Obadiah's like, send anyone else. Because the last guy who said he saw you and you disappeared, Ahab killed him. I don't want to be that guy. I'm not ready to lay down my life for, for going to him and telling him this. Anyway, he convinces them to go. And when he goes, meets with Ahab, and then he comes up and he tells them, get all the people together. And then when all the people are gathered together, this is the passage right here. If the Lord, how long will you fall, falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. He's saying, you know the truth. Folks, how many times, like I can't tell you how many times people come up to me, high school kids, come up to me, Abuna, is it okay to date? I'm like, again? Again? <laughs> again? Abuna, is it okay if I just, and sorry to, to get real here, is it okay, is like a little bit of pot okay? And I'm like, what? <laughs> As if they're expecting to come to me and get some kind of different answer than they got from the 15 other clergy and Sunday school servants and parents and uncles and aunts and whatever in church that have told them the same exact thing. It's not that we don't know the answer. It's not that we don't know when we're dressing a little bit risque, when we're acting a little bit risque, when we're behaving a little bit. It's not that we don't know. It's that we dance between two worlds. Next slide. <laughs> These people are the best at dancing between two worlds. I've come to appreciate this man's talent at dancing between two worlds. Not a fan of his politics, but I am blown away when he's asked the question how he can give an answer that can be interpreted 15 different ways. <laughs> Does it very well. Sometimes when we are faced with something, a spiritual challenge, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We dance between two worlds. When Elijah asked him, how long will you falter? It's the same word in Hebrew that's used in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26. Let me read it to you. So they took the bowl which was given them, and they prepared it and called in the name of Baal. These are the priests or prophets of Baal. From morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us, but there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leapt around the altar which they had made. This word left is the same word for how long, when he asks them, how long will you falter between two opinions? This word falter literally means to dance around. 
In other words, these were people that were dancing around the truth. He's saying the prophets of Baal dance around the truth. We too? How long will we dance around the truth? How long will we go back and forth? How long will we... We know the right answer. We know what's right. But we dance around. We look for loopholes. Number two. People that are stuck between two worlds don't only dance around the truth, believe their loyalties are also divided. He asks a very simple question. If the Lord is God, worship Him. Right? If Baal is God, worship Him. It's a fair question. Which is God? Is it the Lord or is it Baal? Is it what we know to be true or is it what we know ah, deep down is wrong? I'm convinced, I'm convinced that every single one of you know the truth. I'm convinced 99% of you know the truth. Maybe some of you, literally, you're just stepping into church. Let me not make assumptions. The vast majority of you know the truth. The vast majority, if not all of us, know what's right, but our loyalties are divided. And he's telling us there is a far cry, a far difference between service of God and service of Baal. There is a notion today that the only important thing is to have some kind of a religion. We live in a postmodern, post, in, a, in a secular postmodern world where all that's important is you have some kind of religion, you be sincere about it, and whatever your heart tells you, follow it. Right? But if the Lord is God, we should follow him. This notion of having divided loyalties, like I hear people, young people and old people say all the time, well, I accept everything in the teaching of the church, but not that. <laughs> like, <laughs> let me get, bow down, give you a ton of kids. Like, really? Like, Okay, so give me a reason. Well, I'm just not comfortable with that. Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent reason. <laughs> excellent reason. I'm just not comfortable with it. As long as, but I, I really feel that this is right. You feel that it's right or wrong. We just said earlier, so one of you said it. It's not what we think or what we feel, right? It's what we know to be true. If we know something to be true, stand on the truth. Stand up for it, even if we stand alone. Number three. Number three. People who are divided between two worlds don't only dance around truth and divided loyalties, but they, I believe, delay action. They procrastinate. They're distracted by all these different things. It's one of the best things when you're trying to study, right? Social media. It's the best thing in the world. It's the best thing when you don't want to study, but you got to study, right? Best thing. It lets you procrastinate. I ask people, like, how long do you study for? And people tell me they study for 12 hours a day. And I'm like, are you on social media? And they're like, well, not the whole time. I'm like, right, just in between. Whenever it pops up, right? It is the best method of procrastination, social media. Right? So a bunch of you are like, yep, yep that's right. <laughs> he asks the question, how long will you falter? How many sermons do you want? How many more Sundays am I going to go to church? I think that the two biggest times, there's a third one kind of, in close third place, I'll leave it out just for this group, but there's two main times where people repent more than any other time of the year and it lasts about five minutes. Anyone know? Yeah. New Year's Eve, yes. New Year's Eve, man. People are in church, they're kneeling five minutes before we turn up lights, people are praying and God, this year's going to be different and I'm not going to eat that extra scoop of ice cream every night and I'm going to quit this sin and I'm going to... New Year's Eve, man. People are repenting they're changing their health habits, they're changing their spiritual habits, and they're turning over a new leaf, and it lasts about five minutes. <laughs> right? Second time. A good Friday, which is also a funeral. I was going to say funeral. Okay? Good Friday fits with it. Funerals. Man, people come out of funerals, they're like, man, that was my favorite uncle, favorite aunt. That could have been me. Man, God, thank you for giving me another chance. And they come out of fear like they're like angels. 
and again by within 48 hours you as if nothing happened <laughs> how long will you falter he asks if the Lord is God worship him mm. if Baal worship him why do we keep waiting on waiting there's this notion in some churches and there's this notion in some of our minds when I get a little bit older I'm just in high school I'm going to college that's time for me to do my thing uh-huh. Uh -huh. So we all like, don't make eye contact with me. All right? How long will we falter? How long will we keep putting it off and saying, I got a little bit more time? And God, this is not about me scaring you and saying, you're going to get hit by a car and you never know. It's not about that. It's about we're missing out on the opportunity to worship God and to live with him and to enjoy his experience, his presence. This is not about me saying, but if you don't, you're going to go to hell. This is so much bigger than that. This is about us missing an opportunity to stand on the truth and to experience the rock himself on a daily basis, to commune with him, to experience him. And we just keep saying, in a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Just give me, give me just one more year. I'm about to graduate high school. I'm about to graduate college. Just a little bit longer. Fourth, fourth um, aspect, fourth aspect. People that are trapped between two worlds don't only dance around truth, divided loyalties, delay action, but many of them just do nothing. After he asked this very simple question, what was their response? Not a word. They just kind of looked at him. Not a word. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Abuna. <laughs> Give you a perfect example, personal example. I know that eating at two restaurants, if I can call them restaurants, will kill me by the time I'm 50, okay? KFC and Taco Bell. <laughs> but I can't get myself to stop. I know that it's wrong and it's bad for me, but at the same time, like, you're just driving by Taco Bell and the little bell and it calls your name, come, <laughs> especially down the back. We know, we know when something's wrong, but we just, we do nothing. We don't act on it. We do nothing. The people answered him not a word. So these are four aspects of people who I think are torn between two worlds and are dancing around, divided loyalties. They just keep putting it off and they just do nothing. They ultimately, they're like, well, so what do you think? Yeah, it's good. Ah, okay. Come out of virtue. Yeah, that was great. Well, so what are you going to do? Ah, ah. They don't even say, oh, they just start making funny stuff. <laughs> like, say something. <laughs> oh, get on my. <laughs> People trapped between two worlds. How long will you falter if the Lord is God? Worship him. If Baal, worship him. I'm going to give you four examples, four aspects, if you will, of what I think is important for us to make difficult, like to stand on the truth, to make the difficult decision. Folks, every one of us, we're supposed to talk. I told you guys about those four or five things tonight, okay? The dating dance, you, the ones that you've heard so many times. Does anyone need a refresher on those things? Okay, you know. You know the church's position. Like, I'm going to offer you nothing new if I sell, tell you that when you're 15 years old, there's no point getting into a relationship, right? I'm, I'm going to offer you nothing new. If I tell you, quit dressing risque, or quit listening to music that's going to mess you up and mess up your mind. You're going to hear nothing. You know the answers. You know the truth. Right? I mean, is there anyone who's confused? If you are, I invite you afterwards. Come talk to me about any of those subjects. I'll be happy to wreck your mind for about five minutes. Okay? I'm only joking. I'll be nice. Okay? But I think there's four important things when we look about making difficult decisions. When we look at St. Mary, she had a difficult decision to make. She had to stand for the truth. Even though she knew it was right, she didn't say, yes, I'll do it and accept it. Elijah, Elijah, you think he was doing cartwheels without going facing Ahab and Jezebel? You think he was? He's like excited. These people want to kill him. He's like, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, right. Israel had a difficult decision, right? Face right in front of their face. Put right in front of their face. You got two choices. Mm -hmm. 
we have difficult decisions to make every day. And I think we've got to make hard decisions to stand for the truth, even if it means we stand alone. Number one is think before you act. This is something that we've probably been hearing for most of our lives. Think before you act. We tell it to our little kids. When we get older, we're told as big kids, think before you act. Oftentimes, we make decisions based on our heart. What feels good, what, like it's just, but it, it feels right. But think before you act. A heart choice may meet a long view. Oftentimes, it's taken without careful consideration. A head choice, a head choice, is a decision that makes a lot of sense on paper and has been seasoned with prayer. Heart choices feel good at the time, brings an emotional high, but those emotional highs are usually short-lived. One example, and I think, by the way, making hard choices all the time, it's a sign of immaturity. That's what little kids do. Most little kids. You guys know the, the research? Little kids, they, were, they brought a group of little kids. That, you guys know the marshmallow research, okay? Anyone not know the marshmallow research thing? A right, few. Huh? Okay. The short, I'll give you the very, very, like the Cliff Notes version, okay? They brought a bunch of kids together, and they basically put in front of them a marshmallow. They said, I'm just going to talk. Okay. Thank God. Oh, no, we need it. <laughs> All right. So they put in front of them a table and said, brought them one by one and said, if you eat this marshmallow, wait, whatever, five minutes, ten minutes, however long. If you can wait that long, that period of time, you'll get a second one. You can eat it now if you want. Some of the kids, they couldn't control themselves. The kids that could, they got the second marshmallow. When they did research, they looked at them years later, same group of kids, the kids that waited much later in life, these were, kid, they, these were people who had a lot more self-control, they tended to be more successful, they were able to think before they acted. And it impacted them, their lives. Okay? These people tended to be more successful because they didn't act on their impulses, they didn't act just based on what felt good, but what made sense as well. Those of you who get, do any of you guys still get um, uh, allowance? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I was your age. All right. So when you're younger, you get allowance. We, you know, like people, kids that get allowance, what do you want to do? You want to take it, go to the candy store or go to whatever, buy like these cute little cheap things and eat them or whatever. Okay. Or you could save it up and buy a bike. Or buy, I guess these days people don't ride bikes. Okay? Buy a phone or something, right? People that tend to think before they act and resist their impulsivity tend to be better at making difficult decisions and standing for the truth, even if it means they have to stand alone. Number two. Ignore public opinion when it gets in the way of principle. Chasing popularity, I'm convinced, is like a vapor. It'll never satisfy, you'll never catch it. It'll never fill you. It'll never be good enough. Just keep going after it more and more and more. Public opinion today, all over the world, is all kinds of messed up. A lot of people, like those people that I showed, that guy who danced around the truth earlier, a lot of us kind of do the same thing. Wait to see what everyone else is saying and doing. What is everyone else thinking about something? Then we jump on it regardless of principle. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 7 and 13, we find Obadiah. He comes and asks, remember, he asks the question. He goes, I, like, I'm the one who protected these prophets. And then he's told, go, go and talk to Ahab and tell him I'm here. There was a sacrifice. There was, there was 
like he did it for these prophets, but not this one, because this one would have gotten them hurt. So he said, like, listen, I, like the other ones, like, it was fine. I could get away with it. This one, this one's going to hurt me a little bit. That's the notion of standing up when it gets in the way of principle, when it gets in the way of what we know to be true. Is like there's no easy way to say it. There's going to be times we've got to sacrifice. There's going to be times where there is danger that we face for standing up for what's true. Let me offer to you in my own life that there have been times in church where I had to stand up and be the voice to say, folks, this is before I was ordained. What y'all are doing and saying is racist right now. People looked at me like, you're crazy. Like, how could you talk this way and what? Other times where I'd stand up and say, like, I'm not comfortable with the gossip that's going on here. I'm really not comfortable. Okay? Public opinion said, we're not gossiping. We're, uh, what is this? We're just talking. We're just sharing. We're, oh, we want to pray for these people. No, 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 come on. We're gossiping. Okay? Sometimes we have to stand up for what is right and true. But everyone else is, everyone else thinks a certain way. Everyone else is out. Like, I can't tell you how many kids come to me in high school, tell me, like, but Abuna, all my friends have girlfriends or boyfriends. As if, like, oh, okay. oh, now we're good. Yeah, go ahead, do your thing, man. Ignore public opinion when it gets in the way of principle. When it gets in the way of principle. Go with what you know to be true. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to hit bumps and bruises. Get back up and keep going. There will be times where when you do what's right, you're going to slip and you're going to fall. And people are going to say you're a hypocrite. They'll say it. And you're going to say, you know what? Maybe I am. Maybe I am. And you're going to fall down. You're going to get back up. And you're going to say, but i, I got to do what's right. There's going to be times where you're going to do what's right. And you're going to get knocked down by people. And it's going to hurt. And you're going to need to come back to the bosom of the church and be picked up again by Christ. Be lifted up again and say it's okay. And for you to find someone, a spiritual brother or sister, spiritual father, who can pat you on the back and say it's all right. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. I'm not discounting the importance of having someone who can lift you up. I think it's critical that we learn to come in prayer, get on our knees before God, and allow Him to lift us up. But in addition to that, I think it's important to be able to come to someone and open our hearts and say, I'm really struggling right now. I want to do what's right. But sometimes I feel like I'm all alone and people are beating me down. When I started my journey back in 2000, I sat in that office over there with Abuna Gabriel sometimes at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, like struggling. And I'm like, Abuna, I'm, I'm really, like, I want to do what's right, but like, Everyone, like, I literally found myself all alone. He's like, it's okay. He's patting me on my back. And, like, sometimes we need that voice. We need that voice to encourage us and to lift us up. Number three, respect the effect that it has on others. Standing up for what's right and what's true doesn't come without impact on ourselves and to others. It's important that. It's important that we take into account how our decisions will affect other people. So let, let, me, let me put it more simply. If you make a decision to stand up for what's right and you're a young, single person, it affects you very differently than me as a married person with three kids, right? My decisions affect more people than you as a young, single person, okay? So I have to also consider when I speak about something, not just as, not me personally, my decisions also affect an entire parish. And not just a parish, but maybe the Coptic church in general. So if I say something publicly, it could impact people in Egypt, for instance, as an example. Okay? If you're a young single person in high school, college, and you want to stand up for truth, it's, it's going to affect you personally. Don't get me wrong. It might affect a couple friends. Maybe affect your family. And what I'm saying is it's important to keep those people in mind as well. Keep those people in mind. Okay? 
I've had to learn the hard way that my decision, standing up for truth, affects my wife. Like it or not, I have to think about her and my children and my parish when I make decisions, when I want to stand up for the, the truth, which only challenges me to do so in a more sensitive, respectful, Christian manner. Okay? This is not about paralyzing us. It's about giving us perspective that we belong to something bigger. When you and I, when any of us go on retreats, what are we told first thing when we show up to a retreat? You represent your church, right? When you go to a retreat, that's what your, your, your Sunday school servants say. When you make a decision to do something right, it reflects on the whole church. When you make a decision to do something boneheaded, it affects the whole church. People are like, man, a Coptic church. <laughs> or man, a Coptic church. Second one sounds a lot better, right? Fourth and final. Fourth and final. <laughs> Surround yourself with trusted advisors. Surround yourself with trusted advisors. Standing up for the truth means that sometimes you have to show up and say, I, I honestly don't know. It's so one of the best things to say is, I'm not sure. Because none of us will know the answer 100% of the time on 100% of things. We need to surround ourselves with trusted advisors who can turn to, say, Abuna, I honestly, I don't know what to do about this. Or uncle so-and-so, or friend so-and-so, like someone who is a spiritually mature person who we can look to and say, I honestly don't know what to do here. What do you advise? What would be amazing is if you have that kind of relationship with your mom or dad, and you can turn to them and lean on them. That would be amazing. I know some of us don't have that relationship. Part of the reason might be because we create the walls. Because we know that they might tell us the things that we want to do that they, uh, we're not sure. Uh, so what are you going to do? We're like, ah. so we just create walls. We don't, we need to surround ourselves with people that can guide us, that can advise us. That when we're struggling and we're like, I want to do this, I'm not sure what to do, I'm not sure what to expect, we can go and lean on those people. We can go and lean on those people and be guided by them and be strengthened by them. One, one, one last thought on that and then we'll wrap up. We talk about surrounding yourself with someone, a trusted advisor. This is like a personal principle that I live by. If I go to someone, if I go to Abuna and I say, Abuna, like, what should I do in this situation? Whether it's a spiritual struggle or it's something with the church or it's something family-related, whatever it may be. If it turns out well, if I take his guidance and it turns out well, I always give credit back to Abuna every single time. Say, Abuna told me X, Y, and Z. If it turns out bad, I take responsibility. I never show the blame on someone else. Now, some of you are going to say, that makes no sense at all. Like, he gets the credit and I get the blame? Any of y'all who know anything about sports knows that a good coach or team captain will always, if the team wins, they disperse all the credit to the rest of the team. If they lose, they say, man, it was my fault. Right? I think it's critical that when we surround ourselves with people that are going to guide us, that we're willing to do the same exact thing with them. It shows a sense of humility and respect and value for what it is that others are feeding into our lives so that we can grow and continue to stand on the truth just as they've modeled for us. Let's close out. All right? Let me just, one last thought for you guys. Let me make it clear. I'm not saying that this is easy. We know it's right, right? I mean, anyone wants to disagree, I'm, I'm happy to discuss. But I want to just, for the, for the benefit of the conversation, we all know that this is the right thing to do. I'm not saying it's the easy thing to do, okay? And I think the most important and beautiful thing that our Lord has given us is a body to surround us and his own spirit to indwell us, to give us the strength to stand up for the truth and to give us the light to witness to the truth and to be the truth, the source of the truth in the world. Any questions? Yes. Um, do you think there's like the so so like example the first level like my or something. Would that 
will that give you like more of a blessing even if like so the next level is like either you getting punched or or you getting like killed like does that make it more of a blessing for sticking up what's right I'm not sure about like the the level of blessing and stuff on, on a personal level um, some might say yes yes some may say no like some would say yes absolutely there's more blessing than that I think the biggest blessing is just to know that I'm standing with Christ and there's no greater blessing than that and from my opinion okay um, it is a blessing of, of sorts to be able to like St. Paul said it we've been given not only to know the truth but to suffer for his sake Philippians chapter 1 or 2 I believe it is okay so suffering for the sake of Christ absolutely it's a blessing for us to be able to do so um, but the most important greatest blessing that we've been given is to be able to live a life of communion with him, to be united to, uh, with him, um, and to, to, to witness that truth, even if it means that we get bullied or punched or beat up or whatever it may be. Okay? Of course, we, we, we are a church of martyrs. We, like, we have our own our calendar. Our calendar is the year of the martyr. Like, that's how much it's important to us, is witnessing for Christ. Whether it's shedding blood, or it's witnessing through a life of humility and a life of holiness. Okay. So just no matter, so like no matter what. Just... I think the, the biggest blessing that we should seek after is to live with God every single day, to mm -hmm. unite ourselves to Him. Because and I'll tell you, the only reason I say that is because sometimes people only find blessing if they're being bullied. Then they don't feel the presence of God unless it's like some people I know only if bad things are happening to them and they say, now I feel the presence of God. But we have to learn to experience the presence of God in the good and the bad, right? But I, I just I would encourage every one of us to seek, like Saint Mary for, and, and and she's a she's a perfect model of what humans are to aspire to. She's the first one who united became united to the Word Himself, to God Himself. Okay, so that's what we aspire to to be united to Him, just as the Theotokos. Whether there's good. Or there's that. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, it's kind of. Yeah, it's kind of out of not out of the topic completely, but it's something like he said. He said some people only feel the blessing when they're in trouble or something. But he said we also have to feel the blessing when when something good is happening. So could we say I only feel God? Or like not, I only feel the presence of God, like with trips with my family. Um, like you associated with some special events with people. Like could that be thing? Because I feel like if I said if I'm alone, I might not feel God or something. Y you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and I think that's a, a real challenge that a lot of us in the church face. We we are able to experience God in community but not personally. And I think both, what, what we oftentimes do as Christians is we categorize ourselves. Maybe not even like we don't realize we're doing it, but we experience God in family or in the church setting. Some people, like they love, they'll, they'll be in church. If there's liturgy every day, they'll be in church literally every day. But their own personal life of prayer maybe is lacking because they don't feel his presence when they're alone. But it's not about feeling, it's about experiencing, it's about being one with Him, right? But sometimes we mistake, forgive me, experiencing God with I enjoy being around others and worshiping Him, but it's still from a distance. Others, they say, no, no, I like to be with God alone. And I don't like being around those people in church because they're bad people, or they're hypocrites, or they have their problems, well, whatever it may be. Okay? So we sometimes categorize ourselves in this group or this camp. And I'm saying both are important. To have a full spiritual life, it should be in community, must be in community, but it also has to be personal. I mean, Christ himself said, go into your inner room, lock the door, and pray. Right? Well, you just threw something else. I want to, you said, you said it could, like, there is a, like, not a division, but it could be, we need to experience both. But what is your comment also on something such as, I will, like, for a person who's a very social guy, he does really touch God, and like he he gets very personal with God. And like, for example, like Bible study, 
you know, I mean, not really his quiet time. He sees that his quiet time could be a, like his alone. He could be distracted. He doesn't. He doesn't understand that th that could be a weakness he needs to work on, or he could associate something as he he links the situation and go go very deep with it, and it's positive. It's not like no. Like, I, listen, and that's what I'm saying. I, I I think if I may, you strike me as someone who's an extrovert. I myself <laughs> are an extrovert. Okay. You have no problem speaking a lot, being around people. You get energy from being around them. But we need to distinguish that from connecting with God in community. Because sometimes we can be around a bunch of people and not connecting with God in community. Okay? I see. The, the perfect example is when people say, I'm going out for fellowship and they're going to have pizza. Pizza is not fellowship, folks. Taco Bell is not fellowship. Taco Bell is the devil, but Taco Bell is not fellowship. Okay? So, I'm simply... No, I'm joking about Taco Bell. Being be nice, be nice, okay? Um... So, uh, connecting with God in community, uniting with Him in community is one thing. Uniting with Him, our goal should be to unite with God in life. That includes when we're in community, and that includes when we're by ourselves, personally. The challenge that I found as an extrovert is my energy comes from being around people. So it might be a little bit more hard for us or difficult for us to connect with God. It requires more work, if you will, to sit alone and to go in and to think and to process and to pray and to connect with God and to shut off the things that connect us to people and stuff like that. Okay? It just requires more effort. But it's it's equally important to seek to unite to God in every single part of life. That includes work. That includes church. That includes sleep. That includes eating. That includes every part of life. Okay, that includes for married people when they're in their married relationship, whatever it may be. Unity with God doesn't stop when I st okay now I'm going here. I'm leaving God at the door. I was preaching a sermon a couple of weeks ago in church. I said like Christianity, we don't vacation from life with Jesus, right? So I think we just need to get rid of this sacred secular divide in our minds. God is here, but He's not here. No, no, God truly is present everywhere we go because he indwells us. He's not with us outwardly only. More importantly, he's with us inwardly. We're told that we're temples of the Holy Spirit. So there's no place that he's not present. And what you do in a temple is you worship. Right? You praise. So I think we need to shift the way we view God and ourselves in the world. Yeah. Yes. What I just wanted to comment on what George was saying, that um, that if you like, first of all, I, extra in, extroverts have the struggles of you know being alone, but introverts have the struggles of being in the masses, especially yeah. in Egyptian community. Um, <laughs> and. Um, what George is saying, if you think about it, like a marriage relationship, like if all the extroverts only did, you know, social activities with their spouse, but never had one-on-one -on -one time with them, you're not going to really have a good relationship, you know. But and the true and the opposite is true, you know. You have to, you have to have a good balance of being, you know, in community and alone in in a marriage relationship for it to be healthy and well-rounded, you know. And that's the same. And the, I think really part of the problem is really understanding that he's tangibly there. It, the distraction wouldn't be overwhelming if you felt his overwhelming presence in your presence, you know? So not just you, but all of us. Like, I think that's where it comes, what it comes down to. And I think that's where we struggle because so much of our society is so, it's like very tangible now. And, the, and social media has trained us to get instant feedback. And we don't get that from God in the way that we want it, although he, he is like the greatest feedback we'll ever have in everything. But we don't feel it the way that we want it. So. Hey, can I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. I thought this is the last thing. There's a, there's a really good book that I read in years ago called uh, One Story Universe. Uh, I don't know if anyone has heard of it. But the, the notion is this, that sometimes we compartmentalize God. Uh, it, it's based on a wrong... Uh, metaphysical view of the universe and of the created order. So the, the two-story universe says this, that God 
is up there somewhere on the second story, that we're down here on the first story. When good people die, they go up to the second story, and bad people die, I guess they go to the basement. Um, and whenever we hear creaking, someone walking up there, we say it's a miracle that something has happened, but he's up there and we're down here, and there's this divine. The Orthodox view is a one-story universe, and this actually goes very well with the, the stories of the saints. Uh, if you hear like, story, like apparitions, like for the, the mind of the Orthodox Christian, it's not weird at all. Like an apparition happens. That's why when people say, oh my goodness, this miracle, this apparition of the saint, or this icon of this oil, whatever, this icon dripping up. Like, yeah, okay. Like, of course, God is present. His, his promise was, his best promise in Scripture that he repeated more times than anything else is, lo, I am with you always. God with us. His name is Emmanuel, God with us, right? That's his name in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So I agree with you. I think part of the problem is we have put God up there somewhere on the edge of the, When I was growing up, I used to think if you fly all the way to the edge of space, you'll hit some kind of like a brick wall or there, and then there will be like these beautiful uh, gates and that's where God is. He's way out there on the second story universe, like on the second story. But I think this notion is vastly disruptive not only for our theology but our spiritual experience of God. Because now we've put God way out there and no, God says I'm with you always. I'm inside of you, I'm with you, I'm never leaving you. So that impacts how we live our lives. It's not, and that's why, and like those of you who teach Sunday school, you can keep singing the song, but this song, oh, be careful little eyes for the Father up above is looking down in love. Like, no, no, God is present with us. He's not just up there looking. No, he is. And I know there's language and all that kind of stuff in Scripture that he's above and he's up. I get it. But theologically, we need to understand he's present with us, folks. We say everything. Actually, the fraction during this season is Emmanuel himself is on the altar with us. We receive him in the Eucharist. Like, that is incredible. I want you, next time you go to liturgy, if y'all are coming to liturgy tomorrow morning, Abu Nabi Benjamin will be praying and I'll be praying with him, God willing. But I want you, next time you go to liturgy, whether it's tomorrow or it's Sunday, is to really just. Meditate, contemplate on that truth. God Himself, who is inside of you, is also on that altar and He's offering Himself to you. Okay. May God be all. Thank you very much, Abuna Michael. God bless you, Abuna Awara. By the way, uh, you mentioned, since you mentioned it, uh, today in the morning we had the uh, uh, a dozen of people here in the liturgy, in, in addition to uh, three abunas. So I hope tomorrow it will be much more than that, to get your blessing and get the, united with God. God bless you all. We thank you very much, Abuna uh, Michael, for uh, this uh, great topic. And God willing, tomorrow we'll have the liturgy from 9 till 11, and in the evening uh, we'll have with us Abuna bin Yamin Morgan uh, talking to us uh, also. May God reward uh, them all. Uh, Sabuna, will you pray for us, please? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for renewing us. We thank you for inviting us to share in your life. Thank you for you are the truth. We ask you to fill us with your presence. Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten us, that you would transform our minds and our lives into the image of the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and to lift us to the Father. I pray, Lord, that you would bless my brothers and sisters and my Father and continue to strengthen each one of us, Lord, to, to witness to the truth, even if it means that we stand alone. And to understand the challenges, the difficulties, Lord, of, of bearing the cross, of struggling, Lord, to witness to your truth. 
to witness to who you are, to witness to your image in this world. We ask all of this in your precious name with the intercessions of the Theotokos, St. Mary, prayers of all the choirs of the saints. Here says we pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but us from the one. Now may the love of God the Father, grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, gift and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.